You're listening to Force Majeure, an actual play Star Wars podcast. My name is Adam and I'm your host, and today's episode will be brought to you after this question from our characters. Tags, how do you feel about the Empire at the moment, given you know they've taken control of your homeworld now? Like, the thing about growing up on Keenabale, Doc, is that there's always been some gang of thugs or other in charge of it. You know, whether it's one of the various Hut clan, one of the various swoop bikes, some criminal cartel or other, the Empire's just another big criminal gang. True, they're better connected, they got more materiel, but I'm not convinced they're any more competent, and I'm not convinced they're going to be that much worse. Like, it's just another thug that's moving in. And, like, yeah, they, they currently control the planet and that, for the moment, but you're telling me that cut off as they are from the rest of the Imperium, Bracca and the other gangs are going to allow that? Nah. There'll be some form of power sharing thing, a few people will get killed, a few more people will make a lot of money, and life will go on for the normal people. It's only those few like us that have drawn the attention that really have to worry. And soon enough, the Empire will probably forget about me and you and this lot. Um... To be honest, it's Bracker remembering my name that I'm more worried about. The Empire seems like harder to shift than most gangs, I think. But Aye, well, they've never tried taking over Keenabale before. Let's see how cocky they are when they can't get any more troops in because of the weird gravitic distortions that are around Keenabale when they're getting taken down by huts hither and yon. I mean, there's nothing there for them now that we've gone. And now that the um, temple has fallen over unrelatedly they'll put a token force in there then they'll forget about it like they do with everything else in the outer rim as I say the Empire doesn't scare me too badly I mean I'm gonna try and stop them doing what they're doing because it has ramifications outside of Keenabale but Keenabale itself will continue as Keenabale always has under the thumb of someone dangerous gradually falling over okay I'm I'm glad to hear you think it's not going to be permanent if there's one thing I know about living on Keenabale, nothing on that planet is permanent. Hi, my name's Ed Fortune, and you're listening to Force Machine. We're going to play some Star Wars because playing Star Wars is fun. I can't play Star Wars on my own, or at least it looks weird when I try. So I have some absolutely fantastic players. Say hello, absolutely fantastic players. Hello, absolutely, hello, fantastic, absolutely fantastic players. players. <laughs> that, that went as well as I expected. <laughs> <laughs> let's get everyone to introduce themselves just so you know their voices let's start with mikey hi i'm mikey i play k he is a human starfighter at hero striker his emotional weakness is his hatred and his emotional strength is his compassion hi i'm mim i play roy roy is a modified b1 battle droid with a career as a hired gun and specializations in bodyguard and heavy he also has an obligation to the bar family Hi, I'm Ross. I play Dr. Smets Karam Danalawa, a Syrian consular healer whose emotional strength is his compassion and his emotional weakness is his obstinacy. And I'm Adam. I play Tychus Barr, a basilisk guardian armourer whose emotional strength is his bravery and whose weakness is his recklessness. And Adam also produces the show, which is why he's always the voice at the end. So, yes, uh, let's get on with the story so far. Sometimes I would I would give this ni- nice little kind of sneaky revelation into the world that they're on. But right now they're on the back of a giant space wheel and there's no, no real kind of like bit of philosophy that I want to contribute right now. Apart from this to say that Froobs, for food that, that is everywhere pro- across the galaxy, it's funny how it's everywhere across the galaxy. And this is a place that you're in that's several, at least hundreds of years old. And yeah, 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 the vending machines, they stock fruit. The limited edition ones. Ooh. The alcoholic version's called Frelp. It is. I have a theory about that. I think the company that ran Froob and Frelp actually died off back in the original Sith Empire thousands of years ago, but they just don't go off. There's probably a Sith Lord called <laughs> Frelp. Um... Darth Frelp, bringer <laughs> of goo. Wait. <laughs> Where we left the players, they had, on the advice of their friend Benakai, uh, the giant space wheel that they're currently inside his kind of... It's a small building that's been attached to the back of his vastness. But if you think of it as 
it's a giant space whale leviathan thing with a backpack and they're currently inside its kind of cosmic backpack dealing with the problems therein. Right now they're in the vending uh, cafeteria area watching as a uh, hideous kind of mutant tree thing slowly but surely dissolves and falls apart. You can kind of see the central area and as these as it kind of starts to wither and fall apart you actually see it, it's kind of burning in a very controlled sort of way for which I have to ask the question what sort of environmental gear are you all wearing at the moment? Full sealed environmental suit as part of my new armour Yeah, same, I've got my flight suit on so I'm wearing an environmental Nan, I'm a droid I was told the air was, atmosphere was breathable and everything I'm wearing a perfectly good lab coat I'm sure I'm wearing slightly more protection than that. We actually sure discussed this as you left the ship, and yeah. there was an agreement that you had some form of respirator that was in the ship, but I can't remember exactly what was agreed. I, I'm going to rule that the, the doc, being a doctor, is wearing some sort of protective face kind of covering that stylishly covers most of his head. But only most of his head, because it's so big with the cone, it kind of stops just above his eyebrows. <laughs> <laughs> The top of my head is feeling slightly itchy. <laughs> this is Star Wars. He can have like a respirator, like a, a little mask, and you're fine in space. Well, I'm, I'm pretty sure we discussed this in like all of episodes, but it's been a while. So let's just like you know reinforce the idea that you're all wearing face masks. I mean, Roy obviously isn't because doesn't need to. Though Roy might want to if they think it's funny. Entirely up to Roy. He only wears faces. He's got a little handkerchief tied around for, for the for the feel of the thing. So on Tychus's environmental controls, um, there is just a little warning. I'm, I'm not sure what Tychus has built as the controls, but I, in my head it's possibly emojis. And it's like, you know, the stink emoji and the sad emoji has kind of lit up to tell you that the, the environment is at least unpleasant, if not toxic right now. And you, you, there is a kind of like, the, the air is now thick, the atmosphere is now thick with burnt plant and some sort of like green kind of essentially some sort of unpleasant polyny kind of thing going on you would imagine that if you weren't environmentally protected you'd all be kind of throwing up right now Kay sits down just on the floor we've had a bit of a fight this is what you do Tychus do you have any universal tape I, of course I do. Just let me dig it out. And uh, he reaches into one of his many kind of strapped on Rob Liefeld esque pouches, pulls out some gaffer, passes it over to Kay. It's a good job we kept our environmental suits on. Since shanking that plant, the air is full of gack. I don't know if it's spores like those weird fungus we found underneath the temple, or pollen, or just this thing's made of plastic. But yeah, glad we're not breathing it. Ugh. Good to know, he says, tearing off a few strips and then plugging holes in his suit. Roy is primarily wandering around while this is all happening, looking for mugs or magnets or... <laughs> he, he's looking for things that interest him. Tychus was injured during the last fight we just had, so if I'm going to try and heal him, I think exposing any kind of wound to the elements is not a good plan right now, so I think I might have to use the supernatural method of healing him. So I, I would like to force heal this man. I rolled two dark side pips. I'm going to choose to use neither of those. I'm going to lean into the convergence a little bit uh, and use the one light side point I have, which I believe heals uh, four wounds. Then he also heals four strain. Thank you very much, that doc. Oh, and Tychus kind of stretches out and like looks where he can see through the bits of his armour that got torn, where his skin is stitching itself back together again. Shudders very slightly at seeing this happen. Ah, that's just a natural. And puts a bit of gaffer tape over the holes in his armour as well. TBC, I'm sure, is squeaking, slightly miffed at the act of... That's not proper medicine, and I didn't get used. <laughs> Ross, as the doc kind of leans into Convergence, you do get kind of vague feeling, a vague vibe, as you stretch out with the living force. And the, the kind of... The immense light side power is coming from Benakai itself. Okay. If you see what I mean. And beyond that, it's not so much Benakai, but also Benakai seems to be this like connection to the part of the force that is that that is hyperspace, mm. that is space, that is the the kind of the com and you just get a very brief flash of a kind of how weird the cosmic ecosystem is, and an understanding that there is indeed a cosmic ecosystem, that they are things that just live and draw power from 
stellar anomalies and rips and tears within the you know in, within reality within hyperspace itself and this kind of and it's all just a little bit overwhelming but it's all very very natural and it all like it's kind of it's it's almost too much which is why you can only take a very small amount of power from it but it it feels for the briefest of moments that I, I think the words whoa cosmic apply to this kind of like I mean, I was about to ask whether it's possible to sort of feel in the force whether like the dying of the plant that we've just killed or from the matter of anything else would tell us anything but if the convergence is sort of that massive the scale involved is going to mean you don't really notice anything in comparison you can certainly try and get the force to learn more about what's happened here that would be a separate role your force talents are mostly influence and healing aren't they you don't have much in the way of sense or anything like that. No, I don't know if, like, you know, if you're tuning into sort of natural, I'll say healing energies with, you know, the suitable amount of skepticism, but if you know, if, if that's what you're tuning into, is that a help in this regard, or...? I would allow you to make a law roll at too difficultly, just because, like, you now that you're, you've tapped into the power and you're in the vicinity, you can, like, go, oh, well, well, well why does that exist, then, if you say what I mean? Three success and one threat for the, my forced perception thing. Okay, so um, the threat I'm going to bank, but you get that it comes from this ominous feeling. And as you kind of like tap back into the, the force, you look at this worm like tree that you see in the middle, and there is a sense of wrong. Within all this glorious paradise, there is a sense of this has gone wrong somewhere, and you can kind of you can follow a line like a tap root. And you're fairly confident that you could identify in the real world where this kind of line, this kind of taproot comes to. But you, you, you're pretty sure you can find where the source is. Okay. So does it feel like the plant is still connected to something else, or does it feel like the plant just, you know, there is more... This plant has an origin somewhere. This plant has an origin somewhere, and there was a reason why it grew the way that it grew inside such a place that... It, it, there's no way this thing should grow that way. If you see what I mean, it shouldn't be nasty. It shouldn't be this kind of ominous attack on sight kind of thing. It feels like a, a an invader to what should be a fairly sterile environment amongst the sterility of space with these sparks. Like this thing has thrived from something, it's tapped into something, and you're fairly confident you could find out whereabouts nearby where this. Okay, I will. I will pay attention for that. Now that you get to to look round properly. This was a fairly sizable commissary, is the best way to describe it, before things started growing on and inside it. And this, this is like a central mass inside that you'd have to kind of look into closely to see what was going on. They are nice tables, nice chairs, what was at some point probably soft furnishings. And like commissary, like gives a kind of idea that this is kind of like a formal room with with tables and like you know plastic tables and plastic t- chairs. This was a good deal nicer than that. Uh, it was more of a if you think of more of a kind of like executive lounge style environment with indeed vending machines and some sort of it looks incredibly ancient. But the idea of a large rectangular box with a hole in the middle that seems to dispense stuff is fairly universal, if you see what I mean. So there's not only vending machines with actual items in there, but there seems to be some sort of like a generic bits and pieces, and there's a there's a shattered countertop somewhere as well. And I would like perception checks from everyone, please, if you don't mind. Just one difficulty. The doc doesn't need to make one because you've kind of already done so. Tyke's got a failure, but with two advantage. I got exactly the same. Sorry, failure to advantage. No failure dice, but free advantage, so I'm going to be sitting there not looking round, getting some soak back. None of us notice anything. <laughs> Tychus has been helping Roy look for interesting cups and um, souvenirs, clearly. So what I'm going to say the advantage is, is that all of you completely miss this weird taproot thing that the doc has identified. So all of you have completely missed that there is a massive crack in the floor that goes in a very specific line somewhere else. If you said, I mean, you completely, you're like, the, the importance of that is not as important as the fact that the vending machine is full of flavours of frelp that you've never encountered before. Exciting, new, and seemingly ancient foodstuffs that somehow have survived the apocalypse. Uh, Roy, cups galore. 
Yay! They're all quite nice. Um, they're branded with some logo you don't quite recognise, but they're all kind of like slightly individual as well. No, no one's like no one's like gone to a machine and made lots of these. They've all got a kind of uniformity to them, but one of them is clearly for one person. One of them is clearly for someone else. Oh. They're all slightly different. What you also find is a very old and very kind of collapsed now because the tree has gotten inside it and broken it beyond repair but what appears to be a uh, service droid um, the sort of thing that would cook and prepare food behind a counter the counter itself is a mess as well but a kind of very basic kind of broom headed lots of kind of spindly mechanical limbs kind of like a janitor spider robot thing is the best way to describe like the treadwell droids like the Treadwell droid, but slightly more... Uh, if you imagine its head is flatter and up at the top, if you see what I mean. The Treadwell droid's like grandfather. Also, it's more brass. got more of a brass and gold finish to it. A steampunk Treadwell droid. A steampunk Treadwell droid. Looks looks a lot, a lot more Metropolis than um, the ones we're familiar with from, from A New Hope. Hey, look, this could be one of my ancestors. I mean, I, I suppose, Roy, but like... Only in that you're both droids. I mean, this one seems to be less martial in intention. But look, I found some more cups. And here, fridge magnets, Roy. Fridge magnets. Oh my gosh, you are freaking kidding me. This is amazing. As you panel through the room as well, just to make very clear what this looks like, it was a nice lounge with vending machines. It had essentially a bartender food-making robot in one corner. Looking at where the tree has come out of, that would have been some sort of large kind of board table, conference room, Knights of the Round Table style of fairy. It's all broken and messed up. It would be quite hard to restore. Why does Ben Akai have a corporate dining room inside him? Jedi. I suppose. Speaking of, Oi, Ben Akai, can you hear me, you great galoot? Yes. Kraken. You said you had a wee infection here. Was that plant thing the thing, or is there more in here that you need us to clean up? There seems to be... a soul. Find... the... cause, if you don't mind, and root it out. They are nice and kind of... Uh, well, well-appointed dark doors to the north and east of where you are. Right, oh then... I don't know if all of you could hear that because like, I sometimes don't know if he's just speaking in my brain or your brain or through the PA or whatever. It all gets a bit muddled. Biggin says there's still something more down here so it's time to go spelunking again. And Tychus kind of rolls his shoulders back again kind of cleans down Clementine, cricks his neck. I'll take point again, yeah? Ross, so the uh, line that you can follow goes towards the east at this point rather than the north. There, there doesn't seem to be any corruption to the north. But as you look around, you also see something within the, 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 the kind of dead leaves. It's kind of just popped up. Some sort of movement. I point at this movement thing. What was that? It skitters. Okay. Did anybody else see that? Nope. No. You sure you're not just getting jumpy? What, because we've just been attacked by a giant plant and we're you know still trying to chase the source of it? Yeah, exactly. Um, maybe. It's- what was that? <laughs> okay, right, eyes open. Mm. Um, and if you see it again, like, try and give us some notice so we can shoot it. Which way did it go? The plant itself rustles. At this point, you've all noticed that there's a rustling movement from within the leaves. I open fire. Yeah, make me an attack roll. Difficulty mm-hmm. is going to be... It's going to be free to actually hit something. Okay. One success, but three threats. Okay, so the threat comes immediately as part of the tree falls down. <sighs> Can I have enough athletics? Difficulty one, check from the party, please. As the tree falls down. Sars. It's all right. One success, three advantage. I get out of the way and I don't smash the cups. Okay. <laughs> one success, one advantage. Just two advantage. With my force power, because I've got the ability to use that, two successes... One advantage and a triumph. You could scoop us all up and carry us to safety. Has anybody failed, sorry? 
Roy had. So do you want to rescue Roy? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll um, do one of those diving tackles to get him out of the way. You do care! <laughs> <laughs> How much damage does your does the weapon do? Base 12, pierce 1. <laughs> okay, so as the whole thing comes crashing down uh, and then... Kay does this heroic dive as he like prevents Roy from getting a full piece of structural tree to the face. You all kind of get out the way and you see what you've hit because you've definitely hit something. And it's kind of like a small squirrel shaped creature that you've just completely turned to dust. And as the tree comes crashing down, what you see is a nest of squirrel like creatures. But rather than being fuzzy, it's more like cilia. So they've got like kind of like a cilia feel to them. But there's definitely a strong squirrel vibe. And I say cilia, it's more like um, they've got like a hard shell that is fluffy. So it's essentially porcupine squirrels is the best. That's what I'm going for. These are squirrels that have been crossed with porcupine slash hedgehoggy things. Armor squirrels. Yeah, they're armor squirrels. Thank you. Well done. They're armor squirrels. They look a little bit more kind of blocky than your normal squirrels, so they're a bit like postmodern in their look. They've all gone like full spiky as well, so they're all like now staring at you in a kind of. And there's like a little hiss, if you see, but there's like a little nest of them. There's like about a dozen of these little creatures. Oh! And I'm feeling slightly bad that we've now turned the entire nest to dust. You're feeling bad. We only killed one of them. Yeah, only killed one of them. Don't... Enough of your squirrel genocide. It's always squirrel genocide with you, Ross, sir. (laughs) Dead as that squirrel. What squirrel? (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so that's not evil plant. Doc, are these these servitors of the evil plant? I don't know. There's not much left of it to examine now, though. You told me to shoot them. I mean, there's a pile of dust I can attempt an autopsy, but... Well, there's a whole nest of them over there. Yeah, you're all right, Roy. I, I'm fine. Thank you. Yeah, sorry about that. I, I, yeah, it was gonna. We'll let them freak out about the squirrels. I think they kind of I don't disagree, but uh, there's nothing we can do. So, um, the doc you may make is a knowledge roll, if you wish. Difficulty two. Two advantage. No successes. No success. You're not able to identify the species. You are, however, able to identify that these are probably from Kashyyyk originally. Okay, this comes from somewhere where they have Wookiees. And probably, probably these were pets, or at some point. Domesticated Wookiee uh, creatures, okay. <laughs> well, now I feel terrible. Doc, why did you make me shoot it? Doc. I didn't make you shoot it. You monster. All right, get in the bag. We're going to take you somewhere else. Come on, in the bag. In the bag. Are you talking to the doc or the squirrels? I'm, I'm talking to the armor squirrels. <laughs> All of them. All of them. We have a brief Benny Hills like scene <laughs> as Roy is chasing around the squirrels, putting them in the bag. Tychus and the doc are shouting at each other, and Kay's just sighing, looking very tired. <laughs> yeah. I like the idea that Roy decided, you know, after after the whole of, of the first adventure, when you know what I need more storage room inside my body for loth cats. Oh no, I, I no, no loth cats nearby, but I found these almond squirrels. That'll do. <laughs> so essentially, what happens is because Roy is enough tree shaped to be tree shaped yeah you would have to roll to put them inside anything but they will just sit on you if you see what I mean and as they move around they will like kind of scamper so they'll they'll find the bag but they won't stay in it if you see what I mean okay what I'll do is I will put the nest into one of my one of the backpacks which we all generally carry for stealing stuff mostly Anything valuable that was in that rucksack that Roy has currently had is unceremoniously dumped out. Is there any food in the backpack? There's some fruits. There's, they're in. <laughs> like, like, like as soon as as soon as they sniff the food, they're like, ooh, ooh. So he puts the nest in there as well. So, so they can come out and sit on top of him, but they can go straight back into his backpack. Like, okay, moral and ethical problem averted. We now have a quest to rehome these, these squirrels. I mean, that's amazing. We've got a quest. Isn't that cool? Yes. A side quest, because we gotta, we got to go clean the whale. But, you know, we found a side quest. Isn't that cool? I feel very heroic. Very heroic right now. I just feel terrible. Hopefully, we'll be able to rehose them. Doc, I think we're going to decide what we shoot from now on. Okay. Thanks for the help and all that, but uh, that was... Mm. Uh, but there's a hole here. Yes, uh, have a look down the hole. 
So uh, as you look down the, the, the kind of big hole the tree made, you see that there's essentially a long, uh, there is a massive, one massive tap root yeah. that goes across. You can also see whether like there was like rudimentary plumbing. As you scan around, there's some sort of like atmosphere generator device here as well. But underneath there is essentially, there is an interface between the building that you're in Mm-hmm. And the living being that the building that it's been clamped to, right. and you can kind of see there's like there's clearly like a softer shell, and there's a slight glow to it as well as you look down, as like a line of power crackles, and you realise that that's probably Benakai himself just flexing. Yeah. Okay. So there's is there enough room down there? Does, does the tap root go in a particular direction? It goes. Yes, it goes to the east. Okay. Well, you've got two choices. We can go through that door over there to the east, or we can go and walk on Benakai and uh, follow the tap route here. What do you think? It's a very much a crawl space. I'm going to ask Benakai my question now, and I'm I'm not going to ask you out loud. I'm going to just so this so if Benakai replies and all of us hear it, then so be it. But but I'm going to sort of share with it a, a, a memory I had from before the from before we went into the temple when I accidentally set an entire bunch of plant on fire and wiped out a species of, what was it called, necro root or something, before we went into the temple. And I'm going to sort of share this memory with Benakai with a sense of remorse and say, this is something I did. Is this something I should do now with what's left of this tree? I'll not make you roll. You tap into the virgins. You kind of try and bring this memory up and try and make it, mark it for the attention of the, the being that you're with. Mm. It's it's definitely asking of this big creature, and I'm assuming it's, there's some wisdom to Benakai that it can guide me with. There is a pause, and then it speaks through the speakers in the building. Okay. Ah, uh, I see you have four for this sort of thing. Um, hmm. living things die. You should allow things to live as best you can. You should also not be foolish about it. Don't let a thing eat you just because you want it to live. But also, be careful where you point that thing. I mean, they're only squirrels, mate. Yeah, that's not the question. I was just asking it. Oh, Oh, I didn't hear. I I was talking to your Syrian. These things happen when one is learning. Do not make a habit of it. Okay, so so it's just so everyone else was clear, the, the question I was basically asking was, does everyone remember when I accidentally set a plant on fire just before we went into the temple a little while ago? Oh yeah, you used your brain to kill it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I, I just suggested to Benakai that I had this capability, not that I'm sure I want to direct it again, and I'm not entirely sure whether Benakai just said, yes please, or just yes but don't aim that thing carefully and don't kill Benakai while I'm doing it alright to be clear the thing that's hurting me I'd like you to get rid of it because it's hurting me things that aren't hurting me that's fine leave them be okay so that was just aim carefully I think so kill the plant, but not the squirrels, Doc. Okay, I'm not. Okay, I, I might need some guidance to know whether or not there are more squirrels hiding in the rest of this tree before I try and kill, <laughs> set it on fire. So, well, the tree is dead, and currently Roy is is mom to about a dozen, like slightly larger, but mostly tiny squirrel squirrel like be- beings. But there is more tree and potentially more squirrels. <laughs> right, I'm going to save that one and. Uh, Okay, this is method of last resort at the moment. I am going to prepare for this, but I want to know if there's any more squirrels first. So are you going, which way are you going east? Are you going through the door or are you going under the crawlway? Door, I think. All right. I mean, the crawlway might be fine, but like I'm quite bulky. No, that's fine. I don't know whether or not I'll get jammed. We'll go through the door. Okay. I'll go first. You, you, go behind. Cover you. Yeah. Okay. Lightsaber in hand, not ignited. Um, it's a pull door, uh, tab for the door. Yep, do that. So uh, it swings open. Mm-hmm. Um, again, nicely appointed door. Uh, there is a small corridor, just big enough to accommodate the party. So you kind of have to shuffle along a little bit. And then there is another door. Okay. 
Uh, again, this this uh, is full of stinky, dying vines. All right. Any that get in the way, the lightsaber flashes on, and I'll just cut away through. Yep. It withers. Again, the blade is heavy in this place it weighs yeah. on you as you use it things wither quickly in the presence of your blade I need to get a, my own one of these this saber is not it's not mine and it feels like it's not mine but it seems to be working keep going sorry Ed it's important to note that I only turn it on when I'm using it so it'll go on hit the vine go off again so it's off more than it is on yeah you're you're, you're conserving its use and yes yeah. It, it, like when you turn it on it also in like especially in this place not only does it feel uh, heavy but it feels creepy it's got this kind of like because it, it has that wine to it as well that's not that's haunted this is the best way yeah it's a haunted lightsaber I, I, I don't like it I don't like it so you get to the other end of the corridor uh, this door is uh, slightly more involved it's a wheelie one so you have to kind of like move the wheel right I'll crank the wheel Okay, yep. you, you stang point. Mm-hmm. And Tychus opens the door. Um, luckily, having four arms, he can still keep Clementine, like, two-hand, as it were, while working the uh, the pivot. So as you um, open the door, um, this room is absolutely packed with, like, vines, which, as you touch them, they fall apart, if you see what I mean. And, the, again, the stench is quite grim, the squirrels suddenly like just are all in the backpack as as the kind of like the air is thick uh what this appears to be as you get into it is firstly you notice that the plant itself has done a lot more substantial damage to the walls of this area also you you get a better look at the vines and the plants and the, the kind of wood here is is decidedly creepier when i say you can see faces you can see the appearance of what appears to be eyes, mouths, and noses, like in the bark, as it were. I'm hoping that's just pareidolia, but I can see faces in this bark. Thanks for the use of the word pareidolia. I didn't want to. I didn't want to use it and then have to explain it. But yes, it seems to be like heavy on the look of, for want of a better way of putting it, skulls and screaming faces, like into the the, the side of this very very dead tree. What are you doing? Are you just leaving or are you going further in? I think as we stand at the door, Tychus kind of looks ahead at what's going and goes, Right, Roy, I'm going to need you to put those squirrels back. The air is too full of doom gunk in here and we don't want to risk killing any more of them by going in here. So if you can just let them out in there and we'll worry about them later. Kay, mm-hmm. I think we're going to need the lightsaber on Super Evil because whatever's in there is not going to be reasoned with on anything less than that, I think. All right. I mean... Assuming that the rest of you can also see what appears to be screaming skulls and faces in the patterns and whorls of the branches. Yeah, those definitely look like faces. I mean, a duff? That one looks a bit like a rabbit. Well, that's something else I was a bit worried about, actually. If we take a bag full of um, squirrel things back on the uh, on the fire opal, are we going to be shunting out like Harvey and our other Lego moths? Let's clean out their area, and then they'll be fine. They can stay here. Aye. Anyway... You want evil. Well, like, we're going to need to cut through these vines somehow, you know, and I'm not sure whether or not a normal version, you know, the normal blade's going to cut it. Let's give it a go. Literally. He holds out the lightsaber. There's a a moment of indecision, and I'll I'll take the bottom bit and click it once, click it twice, click it three times and ignite it. I'm stepping well back. Okay, so you activate the function of it, which pulls across the living force. I will definitely need some sort of roll for that. Give me a second. Can I have an athletics check, please? From from Key. All right, just one second. So what difficulty? Two, please. Oh, so one success and one light side. So we'll put the um, light side into doing an advantage. I'm going to translate that as somehow you are able to call upon the Virgins itself, even though you normally can't with this weapon. There's a pull... Everyone else sees this as well as in the presence of the blade, Kay sinks to his knees because it is so heavy. Uh, it is so heavy in here. And the, the air which was, was which was illuminated by your stab lights and also the kind of the yellow sickly fluorescence of the, the, the building that you're in flickers and flickers and there is a groaning sound 
as all of the plants just go up at once. Roy, were you heading down the corridor? Were you dealing with the the animals? Yeah, I was going back a little way from the way we came to the door and was doing a tearful goodbye to Samantha, Timothy, Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> so you completely missed the whoosh. By the way, this is 100% the, the right thing to do. Had you not done that, you would have had fried, an unlucky fried squirrel. There was a whoosh. The lightsaber turns... I'm, I'm assuming that you're turning it off as soon as you can get the moment. As soon as I feel like I should turn it off, well, we'll, we'll see what happens. But it's, it's on while this is happening. The plants just burn. Just incinerate and turn to ash uh, in the presence. And the, the, there is a heaviness to the blade as well. Rur is standing behind you. Mm-hmm. And um, Tigus and Doc, you can see this aged fellow standing with his hand on Kay's shoulder. And there's a there's a look of approval as well. Uh, just briefly, the, the the figure kind of flickers out uh, in a kind of eerie green light. Just briefly, but once the explosion, the, the the fire, the whoosh, which again doesn't actually do enough to do damage to you because you just literally it's a flash. So singed eyebrows and cosmetic unpleasantness, but none of you will take damage or strain out of this as the room ignites and then is snuffed out. Yeah. As the reaction stops, the lightsaber goes off and Kay just drops it to the floor. It's snowing ashes. And the room in front of you, uh, again, the, the lights are still running, appears to be some sort of environmental control. It is clogged or was clogged with lots of lots of vines. And the only way in is the way that you came in. However, there is also uh, a, now a massive hole heading north. In the north wall, there is this big hole. Okay, have to say, not quite what I expected to happen there. Um, and also, Kay, when you were holding the lightsaber uh, and this room burst into evil fire, mm -hmm. Rur was standing behind you, patting you on the shoulder like a proud father. Yeah. Which I'm not sure. Yeah. I, I don't know what to say, Tychus. I don't know what to say. Can we not do that again? He kind of sinks a little bit. Yeah. I think as you start to sink, Tychus puts one arm out and kind of grabs you and supports you. Yeah, okay. Sorry about that. Didn't quite imagine that was what was going to happen there. That lightsaber is... Evil. Yeah. We probably need to find you one that's not evil for the future, I think. And then we can just fire that one into the heart of a sun. Roy comes back and is like, what do I miss? Are we taking the lightsaber with us any further or are we leaving it here for the moment? We're not leaving it here. No. Here is not the heart of a son. You want me to keep hold of it for the moment, Chief? No. Nope. No, nope. I've got it. Okay. He pulls himself to his feet. Well, don't worry. If I can't carry it, Kay, I can carry you. <laughs> I can carry both of you. I can't carry all three of you. And I'm sorry, that doesn't, that's not how this works. <laughs> Click it back to the base setting. Still holding it, not putting it away. This is an ancient control room. This is the sort of place where you would set environmental controls and all the rest of it. It's got cabinets that you see, filing cabinets, that are quite heavily singed, and one big old-fashioned computer console. I mean, I guess it's worth having a look at the environmental thing on this and seeing what the rest of the environment that this thing can detect, what what the status of the environment is, without taking any you know any of the rebreathers and stuff off. Assuming this thing is still working. Tychus, could you have a look? Aye, of course. Ed, I um, I head over to the console really see if I can do anything check anything out it's basically a mechanics check to get it to work and then a computer's check to get anything useful out of it difficulty for both of these are two okay so that is three yellows versus two purple and that was two success and a triumph so yeah nice how do you want to do that do you want to funzy it up yeah, I think a bit of percussive maintenance. He stares at it for a little bit, squints his eyes, and then just with a single spank on the side, the compartment flips open and starts working again. And I think I'm going to use that Triumph to upgrade my computer's test, if that's okay. Yep, so go ahead and make me a computer test. Okay, so with that upgrade, that is, again, three yellows versus two purples. Three success, three threat, and another Triumph. Nice! Yay! Jammy. So the ancient console 
like hums into life as you you've kind of you pull up engine backups you rewire things you add a little bit of special special talent to it and as the screen pops up and you get a full map of where you are including some hmm there's a there's a secret map here do you trust me to spend the the tram yeah yeah go for it you see a secret map and you look up and the north wall clicks ominously open and on that I think we'll end the episode here as the players stare at the wall as it swings open with a kind of spooky creak because it's a spooky sort of place. Thank you very much uh, and we'll um, let's try that again too. Force Majeure is played using the Star Wars Force and Destiny game system by Edge Studios. Our intro music is by the amazing Sly Fox Audio. Check out more of her work at soundcloud.com slash slyfoxaudio. Our outro music is Suburban Outlaw instrumental version by Forget the Whale, used with gratitude under a Creative Commons license. Many of the sound effects and soundscapes are created using Sirenscape, because epic games need epic sounds. If you're enjoying the show and want to support us, there's three ways you can do that. The first is by joining our Patreon at patreon.com slash forcemajeurepod, where for as little as $1 a month you get access to outtakes, adverts, various other stuff, and my fortnightly ramblings. You can drop us a coffee at ko-fi.com slash forcemajeurepod, or you can leave us a rating and review wherever you get your podcasts. If you want to interact with us, there's a few ways you can do that. We are on the social medias, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter as at Force Majeure Pod. And we're over on Mastodon as at Force Majeure Pod at Dice.cam. You can also join our Discord, link in the show notes. Thank you very much for listening and being with us as we tell these stories. We hope you are having fun and we will see you next time.